to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. We're going to read together um, on the screen. We have the screen because of those of you that have a droid. Um, so we can all read together. Those of you who have Apple, I love you. Those of you with droids, I like you-ish. Don't mind me, I love you. Matthew chapter 5 verse 8. Let's read together. One, two, ready, go. Absolutely not. This is the Bible. We're going to read it like we're reading the Bible. Everybody good? Ready? One, two, ready, go. Blessed are the pure in heart for they sh One more time. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Today we're going to deal with bitterness and offense. Turn to your neighbor and say, let it go. Let it go. Let it go. I know you're not sitting on the seat. You usually sit every Sunday. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. We are grateful as we engage your word today. Let the life and the light in your word permeate any hesitation, any resistance. Let it flood our hearts. Let the seed of this good word fall on the good soil of our hearts. I right now declare that two mile radius from this point belongs to you. Every demonic activity ceases, every whispering, every suggestions from hell disappear. As these seeds are falling in our hearts, they are held and they are kept and they produce fruit. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Guard the seeds of God as they fall in our hearts. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen, amen. Everybody good? Awesome, awesome, awesome. How many of you, how many of you, quick question, and then you'll signify by, by, by raising your hand. How many of you have to have a cup of coffee every day? I'm not shaming, you just want to know, so I know those who are going to heaven directly. How many of you have, have to have? Okay, I said have to, and most of you are like, no, I don't have to have. How many of you um, have a cup of coffee almost every day? Um, just raise your hand. Raise, no, be proud of yourself. Are, are you ashamed of the decisions you're making? I'm not going to shame your addictions. I'm not talking about your addiction today and how you're hooked on it. I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm not doing addictions today. Maybe some other day we'll talk about your addiction, but not today. So if really, if you just like a good cup of coffee and you happen to have it every morning, can I see your hand? <laughs> Why are there less hands than before? <laughs> For, for some of us, there is an inevitability with coffee. Like, you can't engage people without having your coffee. Like, you will not be responsible for what you say, pray the cup of coffee. Any emotion, any reaction, if you cross me the wrong way, I cannot be held accountable. Pray coffee. Post coffee, absolutely, I can be held accountable. That same inevitability can be felt in the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 17 and verse 1. The Bible says, then he said to his disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come. It is impossible that no offenses should come. Jesus is saying, as long as you're alive and you're associating with other human beings, they are going to offend you, period. People are going to step on your toes. People are going to get on your nerves. The heartbreak is inevitable. Pain is inevitable. Ghosting is inevitable. Deception is inevitable. I know he said he was 6'3", but he appeared and he's 5'3". It was a typo. It's inevitable. It's not, it's not a typo. Okay. I'm playing devil's advocate. I'm trying my best here. Hurt is inevitable. Betrayals and traumatic experiences are inevitable. Disappointments are inevitable. Offenses are inevitable. But what is dangerous about that is that there is someone who is lurking in the dark, waiting to take advantage of this circumstance. And his name is Satan, the devil. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, it says, be angry, yet do not sin. 27 says, and do not give the devil an opportunity to lead you into cultivating bitterness. The easy English Bible says, do not give the devil a chance to hurt you like that. The devil is an opportunist. He's always looking for ways to harm you. First Peter chapter 5 verse 8 says, be watchful, be vigilant, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion 
looking for whom to devour. The devil is always looking for whom to deceive, looking for whom to hurt. He's always scheming and planning. Second Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11 says, So that the devil, so that Satan will not outsmart us, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. That verse is actually set in the context of encouraging forgiveness among Christians. The Living Bible puts it this way. A further reason for forgiveness is to keep from being outsmarted by, the, by Satan, for we know what he's trying to do. One of the strategies of the devil is to find ways to convert and to turn offenses into bitterness. When we stay offended, we have been outsmarted by the devil. When you stay offended, you have been outsmarted by the devil. The Ephesians chapter 4 verse 27 says, And do not give the devil an opportunity to lead you into cultivating bitterness. Here are some facts I want you to know, some truths I want you to know about bitterness and offense. Bitterness is a root. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 15 says this, Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Bitterness is a root and like a root, it sinks and sits deep within our soul. We get offended and we mistake the mental forgetting of the event as having dealt with the circumstance. The fact that you don't remember exactly what happened does not mean that the seed of bitterness was not sown in your heart and it's not growing deep under your heart. Improperly handled offenses lead to deep roots of offenses, deep roots of bitterness, usually unknown to the offended party. Bitterness also grows down before it springs up. So everything seems good, everything seems normal for a long time and all of a sudden, boom, you have a rage, a fit of rage and anger. Everything seems good and all of a sudden you hear about somebody and this deep-seated resentment just comes. You see their post on Instagram and be like, that beginning doesn't even look good. Like, what? that house is not even big. Like, something in you just begins to churn. Like, ugliness. Just, God doesn't like ugly. Just that ugliness just churns on the inside of you. So, it first of all grows down before it springs up. And the reason why those things begin to happen is because something has been simmering on the ground. You look good on the outside, but you're bitter on the inside. You look brave on the outside, but you're bitter on the inside. Have you ever um, gotten a fruit you thought was ripe, and all of a sudden you bite into it or you cut it open, and it's not ripe? Uh, the big culprit is watermelon. Somebody needs to come up with a book on how to identify ripe watermelons. So anytime I go to buy watermelons, I, I, get, I, I pull up research, a mini research in the shop there for the signs of good watermelon. They say it's not supposed to be all green. Check. There's some yellow. There's some green. Awesome. There's supposed to be like a big patch of yellow where the, the watermelon was sitting on the floor. You know what I mean? And then the marks means it was strong enough to heal from trauma. Then they, they ask you to, to hit the watermelon. Boom, boom. It's, it feels hollow. I've checked all the boxes and I carry this watermelon and I go home. You can ask Pastor Ambi. I set it up. I clean up the countertop. I'm ready to go. I put my knife, that sucker divides and it's white. <laughs> I'm like, I thought, I followed the, then you watch another video, the person has it different ways. <laughs> Most of us are like that. We look right. We look good. We go to church every Sunday. And then your neighbor that sees you go to church every Sunday knocks at your door and you're upset. I'm like, yeah, well, what, what, what do you want? They're like, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> your, your light is on. The lights on your headlamps are on. That's, I'm, wow, wow. I thought you go to church. Do you guys have midweek services? <laughs> you might need to go for that. I, whatever dose you're receiving now, it's not, it's not working. We look good on the outside until somebody cuts into us. We look good on the outside until some, somebody engages us. The danger is that it, this bitterness begins deep within our soul. We underestimate the severity of the wound of our, our souls. We, pray, we, we behave like it's okay because we think that it's okay. Most bitter people don't even know they are bitter because they've justified the symptoms of it. They've justified the insecurity, the suspicion, the distrust, the anger, the rage, the pride, the sarcasm, the fault finding, the all being overly critical, keeping record of wrong, but you cannot keep record of good. It's just there. Resentment. And we justify it. They cost it. 
Well, who will not be, and we, we justify the instant, no, no, I'm just, I just like p- p- perfection. I, think, I like things done exactly the same way. And, but that's the mask for the bitterness. Somebody has hurt you before, and right now the way to protect yourself is to demand standards that even you cannot meet. And we maxed it. Bitterness also, like roots of a tree, root us to the spot where we were hurt. It keeps us stuck, cuffed in place, imprisons our souls to that experience. Bitterness is a root. Bitterness is also a trap. Luke chapter 17 verse 1 says, Then he said to his disciples, It is impossible that offenses should come. That word offense is a scandalon. The Greek word scandalon. It's the movable stick or the trigger of a trap or a trap stick. is a snare, is a trap, is a stumbling block. That um, stick of a trap is like you get a box and then you, you, you hold it up by like a small stick and you put a bait in there and you're hoping that when the animal comes into it, it's going to shake up the, the, the stick and then the box covers it. That's what offenses are. Offenses are traps. Matthew 24 verse 10 says, and, how, and then many will be offended. That word is candelizo. To put a stumbling block, an impediment in the way upon which one may trip or fall to entrap someone. That's what an offense is. It's a bait that is in a trap. Um, there are people that hunt b- 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 baboons. Um, how they hunt baboons? Baboons are known to like salt. So they set a salt trap. A salt trap is this. You dig a a, a narrow hole in the ground and then you put a a lump of salt in there. And then the baboon senses it and the baboon comes for the salt and they they put their hand in and they can feel the salt. But the, the, the trick is that when they try to get out of the hole with the salt in their hands, they can't. Because the hole is small enough to get in, but it's not big enough to come out with the salt. So the baboon has to ask itself, does it want to come out with the salt? Uh, Does it want to come out without the salt and be free or stay stuck holding onto the salt? In other words, the baboon has to ask itself, do I want to be salty and be trapped? Or do I want to let go of the salt and be free? Most of us are trapped because you're salty. You're trapped because you're salty about what the person said, what the person did, how they talked to me, the way they flung their hand. And you're trapped. Yeah, you'd call it being salty. No, you're being trapped. It's a salt trap. The devil's trying to get you salty to keep you trapped. Offense is a trap. Offense is a trap that keeps us stuck. Offense is a trap designed to tempt us to be bitter. Yes, they offended you, but they did not make you bitter. Yes, they disappointed you, but they did not make you bitter. Yes, they betrayed you, they assaulted you, and I'm sorry that they did, but they did not make you bitter. Yes, they humiliated you, but nobody can make you bitter. It's like getting a lemon, and we have this, when life gives you a lemon, make lemonades. Maybe don't make lemonades. Maybe leave the lemon the way it is. Maybe just leave it and throw it back. Throw it back. You don't have to cut into it. The fact that they gave you the lemons does not mean you have to cut into it. Doesn't mean you have to, to, to suck on the lemons and take in that bit. You don't have to do that. Yes, they offended you, but nobody makes you bitter. Think ping pong. The rule of ping pong is that when they send the ball your way, your own is to send it back without it bouncing on your side. Right? For those of you who play. So they send it to you and your own is to get it above the net. Don't bounce on my side. Most of us, when we are offended, that ball bounces all over your side and doesn't even make it to the other side because you're holding on to it. <laughs> oh, God. It's a trap to keep you b- b- bitter. Being offended is not a sin. But staying bitter is a sin. The devil wants to use the occasion of the offense against you to cause you to sin against God. The devil wants to use the offense against you to catalyze you to sin against God. Offense is a temptation to sin. The devil is watching to see what you're going to do with the offense. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26 says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. The the, the NLV says this, if you are angry, do not let it become sin. Get over your anger before the day is finished. Do not let the devil start working in your life. What's even more dangerous is that 
We have found a way to mask the sin of bitterness in a self-righteous cloak. We've masked our, 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 our bitterness in self-righteousness. And my pastor, Pastor Jimmy Rollins, said, there's no such thing as justified unforgiveness. Our righteousness and our self-righteous unforgiveness displeases God as much as the offense against you. What they did to you displeases God as much as your, your self-righteous unforgiveness. That's why God took it upon himself to avenge for you, to revenge for you. Romans 12 verse 17 says this, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourself. Everybody say, I am not an avenger. No, say it again. Say, I am not an avenger. You are not Thor. You are not Black Widow. You are not the Hulk. You are not Iron Man. Everybody say, I am not an avenger. If you did not star in that movie, you are not an avenger. Everybody say, I am not an avenger. That was in the first service. I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> it says, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place, or, but, but, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance. God is saying, vengeance is mine. I will repay. The devil is trying to get you into a cycle of bitterness and revenge. And God is saying, don't worry about it. I will repay. When you read Luke chapter 17, it's very dangerous for what for the people that offend people. So it is better that a millstone is tied around their neck and they're thrown into a sea than for them to have hurt one of these ones, the, the little ones. God takes care of his own. Everybody say, God, God takes care of me. So bitterness is a root. Bitterness is a trap. Bitterness is a door holder. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 31 says this. Let all bitterness, watch this, and wrath and anger and clamor, perpetual animosity, resentment, strife, fault finding, slander be put away from you. Along with every kind of malice, all spitefulness, verbal abuse, bitterness holds the door for every other thing. It starts with bitterness and then there's jealousy, then there's anger, then there's rage, then there's insecurity. He holds the door. It is the petri dish that every other thing grows in. It keeps you open. It breaks the hedge around your heart. It breaks the protection around your heart. And you're wondering why the devil is afflicting you. Because there is a hole in your defense caused by bitterness and unforgiveness. That's the easiest way to be vulnerable in your soul. Bitterness. He holds the door for all kinds of things. Anger is a natural response. He says, be angry, but don't sin. That means it's okay to have an emotional response. As long as you're not revenging. Disappointment is natural. Sadness, sorrow, they are natural. But bitterness cannot become our go-to natural response when we're offended. Bitterness just leads to other negative perspectives, other negative postures. Bitterness is a root. Bitterness is a trap. Bitterness holds the door. And bitterness is a poison. It poisons and defiles. Last week, we kicked off the, the, the sermon with a quote that had a contended um, origin. We said, if the devil cannot make you bad, he will make you b b busy. This week, I decided to, to coin my own quote so that there's no contention, you know what I mean? Like, nobody's arguing with me. I'm going to say the quote, and when I say the quote, even if you're online or you're in person, you're going to clap. <laughs> we good? Yeah. Are we ready for this? Here goes the brilliance. Um, <laughs> this stuff better be brilliant. Um, if the devil cannot stop the flow of the river, he will poison it. <laughs> stop it. Stop it. Stop it. You don't have to. You don't have to do it. You don't have to. You don't have to do that. Don't do that. Come on. Come on, guys. We're in church. Don't do that. <laughs> Thank you so much. God bless you. That's what you should have been doing, all of you. Follow her example. Don't mind me. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15 says this. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile. That word is the Greek word that means to poison. The NLT calls it the poisonous root of bitterness. So bitterness is a toxic waste that we have to let go of as quickly as we can. That's why I like Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23. It says, guard your heart 
with all diligence. For from it flow the springs, the rivers of your life. And if the devil cannot stop that river, guess what he will do? He will poison it. If anxiety troubles the river, bitterness poisons it. If anxiety troubles your heart, bitterness poisons your heart. If anxiety troubles your soul, bitterness poisons your soul. And the delusion of bitterness is that we think that the poison hurts them and not us. Someone once said that unforgiveness and bitterness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. It's like somebody gives you a, a lemon, you cut it up and you suck into it and then you hope that person feels the, the, the sourness of the lemon. No, it's you that feels it. Bitterness poisons our own thoughts. Can you imagine? Do you didn't know who they are talking to? Is it because I, just, I was trying to be your friend and begin to poison our thoughts? I can't imagine they did that. They were talking to me like that. Then begins to poison your desires. I, it will not be bad if something happens to them. I, you know what? Why doesn't something happen to them? So they know how I'm feeling now. Maybe yeah. somebody yeah. betrays you so you know exactly. Maybe, maybe, just, maybe your car breaks down on the road and then maybe you understand how I'm feeling right now. You know, understand how betrayed I'm feeling. And it begins to poison our perspective. Titus chapter 1 verse 15 says this. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and their conscience has been defiled. The, the living Bible says this, a person who is of pure heart sees goodness and purity in everything. But a person whose own heart is evil and untrusting finds evil in everything for his dirty mind and rebellious heart color all that he sees or hears. We don't see as things are, we see as we are. We don't see as things are. We see as we are. To the betrayed, everybody can betray. To the disappointed, everybody can disappoint. To the distrusting, everybody should be distrusted until proven otherwise. To the bitter, everyone is just one step away from being offensive. Bitterness poisons our perspective. The more we handle it, the more it hurts us. The more we handle the betrayal, the more it hurts us. The more we think about it, the harder it is for it to let go. I was watching this video about these kids. Uh, his parents giving their kids lemon for the very first time and then you see their reaction and they cut up the lemon many kids some of them are it's, it's ridiculous to see their reaction like, mm -hmm. then the eye like it's whoa, the body is like what is going on now there's, there's some kids that are wise and when that happens the first time they're like oh my god they don't want it but then there are other kids that god is still working on <laughs> like i'm just joking please do not email me that was a joke and they get the, the, the lemon, and they suck on the lemon, and <laughs> then they take it from their parents, and then they suck on it, and they, <laughs> and they suck on it, and it's like a cycle, and people are wondering, why do you, why do you keep inflicting? What we don't understand is that your mind, your brain, does not know the difference between a strong imagination and actual events. If I tell you now that there's a lion outside, most of you will secrete as much adrenaline as you will secrete if the lion was beside you. Your brain does not know. It just imagines, oh my God, the hell are we gonna run? And they, so the more you rehash it, the more you go over it, the more traumatized you become. And you begin to lose things. You begin to lose time. You're stuck in a cycle of repeated traumatization because you cannot get over it. And it doesn't just stop in the thing. Bitterness has a way of spreading to everything it comes in contact with. There's a proverb that says that when one finger touches palm oil, it soils the others very quickly. The effect of bitterness seldom stays contained. It seeks out other ways to contaminate everything you, talk, everything you touch, every relationship, every opportunity, every endeavor. It spreads, it grows. A little bitterness goes very far. A little bitterness from one season can spill into the next, from one relationship to the next. Somebody, you have a bad day at work and you carry that and you come home and then you go at your spouse because you had a bad day at work. One bitter person can end the marriage. One bitter person can ruin a relationship. One bitter person can cause disunity in a group. Bitterness spreads. is a poison that surely contaminates anything it comes in contact with. And what is even important, we have a way of seeking out people that support our bitterness. 
We have a way of doing that. Let's say you come in and they, and, they, and then the ushers don't seat you. Oh no, let's, 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 let's use me. And then I say something about Apple and how Apple people are going to heaven. Dread people, we're still thinking about where you're going to. And you get offended. Oh my God, why is Pastor Victor always coming for the droid people? I say, if we has a problem with them. And then you say to one person, can you imagine Pastor Victor is always coming for the droid people? <laughs> and then that person goes, oh no, I think he's playing. Can you imagine Pastor Victor is always coming for the droid people? And they go, yeah, that's true. I don't like the way you're... How often do you come to church? Every week. Can we sit, sit, sit here together? Be friends? Then we'll do brunch afterwards. Let's come for 9, 9 a.m. and do brunch. We have a way of doing it. In the office, somebody, your boss is annoying. You go to the first worker. I mean, I don't, I don't like the way this boss mistreats. I don't, I don't think, I think he's just having a bad... He's having a bad. I don't like the way this <laughs> boss treats. Yeah, yeah, always very... That's a good one. You good for lunch today? Can bring your lunch? Can bring your lunch? We have a way. And when we cannot find somebody who supports our bitterness, we just cower in, in darkness and replay it. Have you noticed how one second of offense can last like two hours in your mind? Like somebody just smacks you. And then when you're replaying it, it's like... And then you pause it. Look, just look, look at his eyes. I knew. We're not friends. The devil is in those eyes. And you're going through it. I'm just playing it. <laughs> <laughs> Most of you know what I'm talking about. It's a poison. So how do we get rid of this poison? The answer is seen in the same place that Jesus guarantees there's going to be offense. Luke chapter 17 verse 3 says, Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, most of you are like, wait, what? And returns to you and I re and saying, I repent, you forgive him. Mm -hmm. Jesus is saying the answer and the antidote to offense and bitterness is forgiveness. You have to forgive. Amen. That word is the Greek word that means to send away, means to send off, it means to separate from, to let go, to let alone, to let be. Jesus is saying if somebody hurts you and repents, you have only one option, let it go. You have only one option. Separate yourself from it. Send it away. Let there be some space between you and the offense. Now, for some of you are thinking they have not apologized. That doesn't include me. I'm waiting for them to apologize. Why don't I turn you to Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, to see what Jesus has to say about your case. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how many times will I, re <laughs> times will I, will my brother sin against me and I forgive him and let him go? Up to seven times. The way I see this, Andrew had gotten on. Andrew is Peter's brother. Has gotten on Peter's last nerve. Because he says, my brother. He says, I, I'm just, just my interpretation, personal interpretation. He says, how many times? Because I'm in number six. I want to know when I cut off his ear after seven that we are good. So seven times? God is like, oh, Jesus is like, no, 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 no. I say unto you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Now, if, I, if my math is right, that is 490 times, which, by the way, is daunting. But I don't think Jesus was talking about math here. He was talking about forgiveness that knows no bounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was he saying? If you think you have forgiven enough, multiply it by 10, then multiply it by the original number. Uh -huh. Then we're in the ballpark of what the number should be in case you are counting. Jesus. But remember, love doesn't keep record of hurts. But just in case you're counting, that's where your number begins. It says forgive without bounds. And sidebar, don't tell me you're forgiving if you've not let go of it. If you keep replaying it, keep referring to it, keep rehashing it. Let us forgive the way God forgives. We see it in Hebrews chapter 8 verse 12. God is saying, I will be kind to them. I will forgive them for the wickedness that, that they have done. I will not continue to think about their sins. Good, good. This is what the Lord says. Everybody say, let it go. Let it go. Everybody say, I will let it go. Paul, the apostle of grace, he introduces the church at large, at large the theology of grace. He, he has a spin on the definition of forgiveness. We see that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32. He says, let all bitterness be put away from you 
Be kind and helpful to one another, tender-hearted, compassionate, understanding, forgiving. That word there is different from the other forgive word. This word is the Greek word that means to do something pleasant, to be agreeable to one, to grant us a favor, to, to give freely. Mercy, we understand, is withholding what somebody deserves. Grace is giving somebody what they don't deserve. Paul is saying, when somebody offends you, give them what they don't deserve. Somebody smacks you across the face and you're ready. You look at them. The worst thing that will happen is you beat me to the ground. But at least I will bite your ear. That is guaranteed. I will bite you and you will lose skin. I don't know where that came from. I feel like I had been healing in my soul. I, that's a flashback real quick to high school. But, okay, I'm back. Um, but you're saying instead of doing that, give them what they don't deserve. And sometimes what they don't deserve is prayer. Sometimes what they don't deserve is understanding. It's the benefit of the doubt. Somebody offends you and you take a step back to see what might be the problem. They don't deserve that. Paul is saying, instead of just letting, if just in addition to just letting it go, why don't you extend something yeah. that they don't deserve? That's forgiveness. And when you're doing this, Paul is saying this, that word forgiven is, is a middle voice. A middle voice is a grammatical construction that has the passive and the active um, word in the same sentence. It's, it's a word that shows the subject acting and being acted upon by the same action. So when I say I, I cut my hair, I am doing the cutting and I'm also the recipient of the cut. Does it make sense? So Paul is saying when you forgive others, it's a middle vi voice. As you're giving them the gift, you are giving yourself the gift. As in your mind you're releasing them, you're releasing yourself. It's something you do for yourself. Forgiveness benefits both parties, but guess who is affected when we choose to hold on to bitterness? One person is. Because sometimes they don't even know that they hurt you. There you are. Your life is stuck for 15 years. Please, after this message, do not call the person that offended you. Like, I'm just calling because my pastor talked about forgiveness. I want to tell you <laughs> that I forgive you. Don't do it. If you're not ready for them to tell you, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> exactly. Most of you know what I'm talking about. Like, I forgive you. You know what? I release you. F from what? <laughs> I just want to tell you, 17 years ago, when you, 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 you stepped on my sneakers, the, the new one I got, the Air Force ones, were like, no, not 17. What was your size 17 years ago? I didn't even see your feet then. <laughs> like, you know, I cannot believe that you can't even remember. Then fresh traumatization. So he's saying, Release them. Release them. Let them go. Let them go. It's for your benefit so that you don't poison your heart. Everybody say, let it go. Let it go. Forgiveness, number one, purifies the heart. Matthew chapter 5 verse 8 says, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. That word pure is katharos. Katharos means clean, pure. It reminds me of a medical instrument, catheter. A catheter is a flexible tube. That is inserted into a body cavity to introduce or to drain unwanted fluids. You, you insert a catheter into a bladder to drain urine. You insert a catheter into a vein to um, eliminate the toxins in the blood when you're doing the, the, the dialysis. So it's a system of eliminating toxin from a space. So when Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, he's suggesting blessed are those who can drain their heart of toxins quickly. Blessed are those who have a system of draining their heart of the poison, of the toxin, of unforgiveness, of bitterness. God wants us to pass a, a catheter into our hearts, into our souls. Leave it there for draining any offense anybody might have, but, but inflict on you. Blessed are the pure. Blessed are those who can let it go for they will see God. As, as, as the offense comes, you drain it. As the offense comes, you drain it. As they toss you the lemon, you throw it back. You come back from work and your spouse says something annoying, you throw it away. Your boss sends you an email that annoys you, you throw it away. Your friend says something, you throw it away. Blessed are those who can get rid of offense very fast. That's the purity of your heart. The state of your heart 
is more important than satisfying an, an, an emotional need. Because it determines if you can see God. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14 says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness. That word holiness, there's purification. It's, it's consecration to purify. Without which no one can see God. Devil wants you to be bitter because it blinds you from seeing God. Devil wants you bitter because it keeps you in the dark. Because it denies you the leading of the Holy Spirit. Because it stunts your revelation of Jesus. Without which... You cannot see your next step. Most of you know you have a dream. You believe God has called you for something great, but for some reason, you're stuck. Might it be that you're stuck in the last place that you forgave? Might it be that you're stuck in the last place that you were salty? Might it be that you're stuck in the last place that you kept rehashing it? Forgiveness. Forgiving other people releases God to forgive me. What do you mean, Pastor Victor? Forgiveness and, and unforgiveness and bitterness deny us from experiencing God's forgiveness. Matthew 6 verse 12 says this, And forgive us our sins just as we have forgiven those who sinned against us. Verse 14 says this, Your heavenly Father will forgive you if you forgive those who sin against you. But if you refuse to forgive them, he will not forgive you. Colossians chapter 3 verse 12 says, So as God's chosen people who are holy, put on the heart of compassion, bearing graciously with one another, and willingly forgiving each other, if one has a cause of complaint against another, just as God has forgiven you, so also should you forgive. We experience the forgiveness of God first. But then God steps back and takes his cue from us. He watches to see how you forgive to determine how he forgives you. And it's not that he doesn't want to forgive you. It's you experiencing it. It's already been done. It's you experiencing it. Are you going to cut off yourself from the supply of God's grace and forgiveness by holding on to it? If you feel that God forgave you selectively, then forgive other people selectively. But if you feel like God has forgiven you completely and absolutely, then he's encouraging you, hey, why don't you forgive completely and absolutely? Just as your God, just as the Lord has forgiven you. If we withhold forgiveness, we deny ourselves experiencing the forgiveness that God gives. And finally, forgiveness frees you. Letting others go frees me. Forgiveness keeps me stuck in a past season, denying me of any real progress into what God has for me that word and um, forgive in Luke chapter 17 verse 3 also means to live in order to go to another place so it's not just about sending away and driving away sometimes it is you that has to leave I'm going to let it go and I'm going to go to the next place Bitterness blinds us and it restricts our revelation. Without revelation, there is no transformation. Without revelation, there is no clarity of direction. Without revelation, the Bible does not make any sense to us. We cannot see the mysteries of the Bible. Without revelation, we waste our time and our energy pursuing things that we, things that we have no business with. Without revelation, we miss out on destiny opportunities, destiny relationships because we are bitter, because we are overly critical, because we are unforgiven, because we are jealous. God has brought people into your life that are supposed to challenge you and take you to the next place but you're jealous and that jealousy is just a a fruit of the bitter root on the inside of you without revelation we're stuck in the past and we miss out on God's best I'm going to end with this story when I was in in, in high school I I I I went to boarding school. And when I say boarding school, most of you are thinking of the European boarding schools you see on, on TV. That, that's not what I mean. I mean more or less a, a prison system than, <laughs> than whatever you're imagining right now. So just come back. Think jail. That's think jail. Then you'll be closer to my experience. And I lost so much weight that, uh, that when it was very windy, I was at the risk of being swept off my feet. This is not figurative. This is real. I was that scared. Don't, don't let this fool you. You know what I mean? I, I tell you people, when I got married to Pastor Ambe, this is not what she saw. She saw with the eyes of faith. <laughs> that is a message for some of you. Uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. End of the single seminar. Feel free. <laughs> So I was so slim and I had an insecurity. 
because I was very slim. My head was big. I still have a big head. My body just grew to catch up somewhat. <laughs> Not quite there yet. But just imagine me slim, my head still there, like bubble. And <clears throat> I was very insecure. I come back from holiday one, one time. And um, I go to see my uncle. My auntie opens the door. My uncle's wife opens the door. And the first thing that comes out of her mouth is, oh, my God, you look like a skeleton. She was not lying. I mean, like, yeah, I looked exactly like a skeleton with some skin over it. But those words went, my, my insecurity paved a highway for her words. And the seed of bitterness was planted deep within my soul. I stayed, I enjoyed the visit and everything. I left that house and I never came back to that house for seven years. It fractured my relationship with my uncle, fractured my relationship with my auntie, with my, my cousins. It just, I, I didn't want to deal with them. When I, whenever I saw them outside, hey, how are you doing? It was plastic fake. She's older than me. I'm African. All we can do is think about what we want to do. We can really say it so that we can be alive. If you're African, you understand what I'm saying. We don't talk anyhow so that we can live to see another day. So I had all these crazy thoughts. Now, what is sad is that this uncle, whose wife said this, is one of my two favorite uncles. I had one on each side from my mom and my dad. And this was the uncle that would take us on spontaneous trips to just shop, shopping sprees, just because it's Wednesday. We just come, hey, get in the car, boom. We get in, just shop. We just stand at the door and we just go haywire. This was the same uncle where we could watch films. My dad would not let us watch in the house. My dad is a pastor, so there's some things that are not applicable in his house. So we tell him, Daddy, um, Uncle, you need to buy this movie. We're going to come on Saturday. So you buy the movie, and then we'll go on Saturday. Oh, Daddy, you want to go and see him? Then we'll go. This, this was the house. This was the fun house. This was the fun uncle. For seven years, I denied myself the gifts I could have gotten. For those of you that know me, know how painful that is. <laughs> I denied myself relationship. I denied myself gifts. <laughs> Lots of gifts. Seven years worth of gifts because of my bitterness. Do you know what is even more sorrowful and sad? My auntie did not know she did anything. She lived in a regular When she saw me, she behaved. There, there was nothing. I couldn't tell her when you said it seven years ago. But it held me there and denied me. And the roots got so deep. That in order to, have you ever tried to dig up the roots of a tree, an old tree? You have to lose a lot of ground to get the tree out. Most of us have roots of bitterness so deep that when God begins to walk on your heart, you lose ground. You lose time. You lose relationships. You lose, you lose energy. You lose impetus. You lose that, that favor to pursue what God has for you because you're spending so much time trying to drain and handle the bitterness on the inside of your heart. Today, God is asking you to let it go. For some of you, all you need to do is go back home and just write out everything. Just pour out your heart to God. Tell God, this is, how the, this is who hurts me. This is when it happened. If you have friends that can create a safe place for you, share it with them. Bitterness thrives in the dark. Bitterness thrives in secrecy. Bitterness is like holding the sharp edge of a knife and stabbing somebody with it. You get hurt. They can be confused. But you get hurt. They can feel some disappointment and shame when you tell them what. But guess who's hurt? You get hurt. You bear it before God. Then you ask him for grace. Because it's not easy to forgive. Especially when it's been long. Because it's easier to forgive closer to the event. That's something I have been doing very well at. Re recovery. I'm saying that she doesn't know I'm going to say it. But that's something I applaud our marriage for. Recovery. One thing Beaton is likes is pride. Because pride keeps you from apologizing. Pride keeps you from owning up that you're suffering. Yeah. Your pride will be like, no, there's no how. I'm going to pass. You don't understand. 27 years, and I'm going to until the day I die. They die, and there you are, shivering to death, 
You get to the judgment throne of Jesus and Jesus says, what did you do with your life? I was holding on to a grudge. Why? They, they, they did this to me. Okay. What did you do with it? I held on to it. You'll be proud of me. My grip, super grip. <laughs> you cannot handle what God has for you with one hand in the past. You can't. Some of you just have to let it go for your good. To free you. Ask for grace. Some of you may just need to begin to pray for them. It's going to be ridiculously awkward. You know when you say like, God bless them. I don't mean like bless them, bless them. As much as bless them, let them see tomorrow. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's it. That's, that's about it. Like, not like bless them, bless them, like bless them. But bless me though, you know what I mean? <laughs> Sometimes just prayer. Prayer. It's not about them apologizing to you as much as you're just freeing yourself. Because you can go there and they can be in an immature state and they hurt you even more. I don't want and I don't think God wants us to live a life of victimhood. I'm not saying you were not a victim of abuse. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying you don't have to remain a victim. You can live a victor. You can live a victorious life. But it begins with you letting go. Let go. Let's go of the pride and let's go. Let's go of the self-righteousness and let's go. Let go of the, the, the need to revenge. Most of us have gotten used to the gratification of unforgiveness. There's that thing where you're, you're holding something over somebody. You're not holding anything over them. You're holding yourself under something. You're really the one under it. They are living their life. You're not holding anything over them. You're holding something over you. You're clogging what should be a free flow between you and God. Through unforgiveness. I, I like this and I have to end with this. Jesus, the, the purpose of that 24 hours before Jesus died, the devil's strategy and his plan was to get Jesus offended. From the betrayal by his disciples to the nonsense people were saying, to the slaps and the beating, the crown of thorns, they stripped him naked, they accused him falsely. The same people that said, Hosanna, Hosanna, were the same people that said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. They, 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 they chose a thief and a rebel leader over Jesus. All of that was leading. People were spanking. All kinds of things to, to, to off offend him. Jesus gets to, just before he dies, guess what he does? He says, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. Because if Jesus had taken that offense, it's called taking offense after all, right? That's what it's called. I took offense. If Jesus had taken that offense, he would have stayed stuck in that grave. Might you be stuck in a past season, denying yourself of a future God has for you, blinding yourself to the leading of the Holy Spirit because of offense. God is calling us today to let it go. Everybody say, let it go.